This Georgia Court of Appeals uh, will now have an opportunity to review Judge McAfee's decision and decide whether or not to just allow it to stand or to hear arguments or to overturn it. Um, does this match up with Trump's general legal strategy of just delay, delay, delay? I mean, yes and no, because you have this part of the ruling that says that they're still going to go through all the motions. It's not that everything is going to be on pause. They're still moving forward. But there is no trial date, as you heard Zach say. And part of this is another turn of the wheel for them to hope that it interferes with setting a trial date. And that's really where they're at. They want everything to be delayed. And I will say, they're still feeling really good about what happened in Georgia. Despite the fact that Fonnie Willis is staying on the case, they feel like they have a win there. And they don't think that case is going to go to trial before November, which of course, as we know, has been their goal all along. The other thing to point out about this is that when you're talking to these senior advisors and going through the process with them, they like the fact that there might be another opportunity to go after Fonnie Willis in public, even if it's not televised, another time to bring her record forward. So just, just to be clear here, so there's the Georgia election subversion case, the federal election subversion case, the federal uh, classified documents uh, case, and then also the hush money payment, the Alvin Bragg New York case. That's four cases. Do we have a date for any of them? No. Not one. No, they had said that they were going to possibly do April at one point for the documents case. Then that got moved. She is also waiting to see what happens in the election subversion case. They are now waiting on the Supreme Court ruling on immunity. So they have paused all of that. As we know, they uh, last week extended the deadline uh, for the New York hush money case for another at it's least just remarkable. It's 30 days, at least it, 30 days. It's 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 madness. Um, and it's not just delay is not his only strategy. It's to continue to push this narrative, Jake, and he's going to do it all year during the campaign, that he's a victim. And all of this justice system is coming after him. So as long as he can demonize these prosecutors, he just feeds into that. But, I mean, are, are, are you – it's kind of just – it's kind of <laughs> bewildering, right? I mean, yeah. first of all, the, okay, so the hush money case, one of the arguments in that case, whatever people think of it, is – that the American people had a right to know yeah. about this uh, affair that Donald Trump had with Stormy Daniels, um, which he denies, but I don't think anyone in the world uh, believes him, uh, before the election, before they voted. Right. Now, you can argue, like, look, the Access Hollywood tape had dropped. Nobody thought that they were electing Mitt Romney here. But still, the American people had a right to know. Mm -hmm. We appear to be heading in towards a legal arena where the American people are not going to have knowledge of at least two or three of these cases in terms of testimony, if not all four. And that's a really important point, Jake, because we don't know what impact that's actually going to have on the electorate, because we have seen in polling people saying they want to know the outcome of these cases before the election. So what does it mean to voters, particularly those who are very concerned about what happened on January 6th, who actually moved away from Trump because of that, to say to them, OK, he's on the ballot again, but this time you don't get to know what actually happened. I don't think we know yet if that's going to, you know, I think the Trump team assumes that's in their favor, but I'm not sure that it is. Because, again, if you have a question about, you know, someone that you might vote for for president, yeah. it may make you less likely to vote but for them. Over here, what the options are here. The options yeah. are you don't know or potentially somebody is convicted of a crime. Right. So if that's the option, wouldn't you rather, if you're the Trump team, go with, I don't oh, know. Sure. Oh, sure. Rather yeah, than yeah, the yeah. early point is that that's yeah. where they're headed here. It's like, sure. okay, sure. If our other option is we know people aren't going to vote for us. Oh, if everybody I'm understands of a crime. the Trump strategy. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just <laughs> kind of stunning, just as a as an right. American citizen, to watch the legal system. Yeah, but yeah. The, the Trump people are. Uh, there is one case that did not go their way, and that is the case from Letitia James. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump is reportedly in panic mode as the deadline approaches to secure this almost half billion dollar bond. Uh, for the civil uh, fraud uh, case in New York so that he can appeal it. If he fails to secure the bond, and apparently no insurance company is willing to engage in it for whatever reason, they could put his New York properties, at least some of them, on the chopping block. But check out this fundraising text from the Trump campaign today. It says, quote, from Trump, keep your filthy hands off Trump Tower. And then it provides a fundraising link that they called an emergency memo. <laughs> He's he's the victim. Uh, and, and Jake, what's fascinating is this it could actually be one example where he will begin to be held accountable, like he's going to have to put up this money. He's known about this for a while. I ultimately think some he's the Republican nominee, some wealthy Republican is going to do something for him.
They I haven't think. yet. They haven't yet. But they haven't yet, but dire geez, times. I, I, I find <laughs> you think it they will. You think somebody will? Yes. Yeah. I, I don't know if it'll be one person. I mean, it's a lot of money. Uh, and even billionaires, I was talking to one of our financial experts today, even billionaires, there's t- tiers of billionaires, and apparently yeah. low-level tiers and high tiers, and we're looking at <laughs> high tiers, a very small population of people who would have to step forward, and they'd likely have to pool some resources to guarantee this bond. But if your options are, again, your Republican nominee going through all this, having to declare bankruptcy, not being yeah. able to pay, having his assets seized and being humiliated, or securing this and guaranteeing the bond so that you have a Republican nominee who eventually, hopefully, yeah. will do things for you in the future. Yeah, so, that's my only thought. So in an interview with uh, GB News that aired last night, um, Donald Trump hinted that if he is reelected, uh, Prince Harry could be deported from the United States. In yeah. his memoir, Spare, Harry admitted to using various drugs um, which has raised the question as to whether he lied about that when he obtaining his American visa application. Here, here's what Trump had to say. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. Appropriate action? Yeah. Which might mean not staying Oh, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. You just <laughs> have to tell me. Uh, you, would, you would have thought they would have known this a long time ago. Yeah, okay. Go ahead, Trump. Go ahead. Please do. Please try. Please try to... Uh, kick Harry out of the country. I think that's going to go over really well. I, I mean, this is so ridiculous. In the same interview, he talked about how uh, admiring he is of the royal family and the idea of the royal family, which kind of yeah, goes... but they, but <laughs> Prince Harry is not really a member in good standing of the royal family. No, no. I, I was actually moving yeah. on to say, uh, and I'm sure in Trump's mind, there's a whole justification for that. But no, I was moving on to say he also was pointing out how much he likes the concept of. A royal family, which reminds us that, you know, yeah, he would like to be, he considers himself the CEO when he is uh, president, not someone who is accountable to his voters. But I suppose maybe he thinks kicking Harry out would be. Uh, who cares? I <laughs> Jake, you led this segment. Two of his indictments, Trump's indictments, involve his attempts to overthrow an American election. Right. And the American electorate is going to go to the ballot box in seven months, not knowing about his involvement, whether he's going to be held accountable for his involvement overthrowing an American election. So, Kristen, you, you still, oh. uh, you cover Trump, so you watch all his rallies, you attend rallies, you, you see. He, January 6th is not just something that he uh, <laughs> defends. It is something he celebrates now. He starts rallies with the January 6th criminals in prison singing the national anthem. Which he recorded which, part of the song for that. And Right, which he was part yeah. of the, and also... Uh, I mean, he calls them hostages. At a time, by the way, that there are actual hostages, including American hostages, being kept, being held in Gaza and in Russia, et cetera, he calls these criminals who are in prison, who are being punished after being adjudicated, hostages. Yeah, I think that he clearly made a decision here. I mean, after January 6th, he tried to separate himself from the event, saying it wasn't. Now he's fully embraced it, saying that they were you know, just patriots. He uses that word. He has uh, promised that he will pardon them as soon as he is brought back into the White House. And you see other Republicans kind of getting on board. I mean, they're maybe not celebrating as much, but they're not rebuking him for what he's saying about January 6th. This has become part of his campaign. And I will say, a lot of his base and his base supporters they were the ones that were there. They have family that were the ones that were there on January 6th, and he has decided not to alienate them and keep them in the fold by doing this. Can I just say, though, having lived through this in 2016, all of these things that we're pointing out, they matter to us, absolutely. To his base, they don't. To his base, they reinforce why they support him, why, because they also see the grievance narrative as that relates to them. Mm. And I think what's important as we go through this year, as we have conversations with voters, we have to bring it back to why does this matter to you in your life? Because I think there's like the other phenomenon here is it's so much, it's such an overload that people, some of it is just kind of bouncing off because people can't absorb all of it. And so I think, you know, again, it's important that we talk about it because I think it's important we surface it. But, you know, the day to day, most people just can't absorb it. Most of his base believes by now that January 6th was a pretty good day. And that's why Trump does what he does. 